So by the late 90s, I had developed a practice of basically collaging my work. Sometimes they wouldn't really even appear as collage. They would be these smooth connections. It was a long, slow car. That's the kind of community in which we lived. I did a lot of text. In some ways, I was kind of like Schoenberg in the atonal period in that I wasn't as atonal as he was. But a lot of times my pieces were short, unless they had texts, and even if the texts were short, the pieces were short. I liked found texts, and one day I found a text in the New York Times about a trial of a woman who had engaged in unseemly behavior with a student. And she was before the judge, uh, or the lawyer, and somebody said, this is not love, this is another cognitive disorder. And I thought that was terribly funny. Just the words. As often happens, a tune popped into my head, this is not love, no, this is another cognitive disorder, uh, da -da -dum -bum. that's all I got. And I thought, well, you know, acapella, what can I do after acapella? Oh, fugues start monophonic, right, and then they overlap. Well, how do you write a fugue? Well, I'd written fugues, of course, in my undergraduate days. But I decided to go to the source. In fact, by this point, maybe I had been influenced by David Cope who talked about going back and writing chorales. He's a computer music guy. So he tried to teach a computer to write. He put in all the rules of music theory. And what he got out was chorales. And what he got out was a sort of a student textbook chorale. It wasn't very good. But then he inputted just box own chorales and let the computer figure out the techniques. And voila, he came up with something. Is that the same vehicle? So, similarly, I went back to the source. I went back to a Bach fugue, and I just studied the entrance patterns. And I did likewise, and the thing worked. So from this point, I experimented with writing symphonies, and on and on and on. And so I would characterize the first part of my career, I kind of assembled things, kind of bric-a-brac. I kind of assembled the bric-a-brac together, and in this next, and maybe, you know, like I say, I only have two periods. Uh, from that point, I would take whole pieces and deconstruct and change and analogize. Fossilization, I'm just thinking about this now, where you know, one substance is replaced by another. Sometimes I think of thrust faults. I've done a lot of, you know, unlike Michael Gordon, I'm fairly familiar with geography and geology, well, you know, at least for a kind of a liberal arts guy. Thrust faults, one kind of idea over top another. So that's where I was when I met my present and long time and future and ever partner, Harriet March Page, who is an opera impresario. Before I met Harriet, I had written one opera, one or two. And that was about 20 years ago. And I can't even tell you how many operas I've written since then. Is it to parody Bill Clinton? Depends on what opera is. So this, uh, our feature piece, <laughs> That's the, way it, that's the way it goes, is uh, one of my operas that I wrote for Harriet. She suggested I write on Tennessee Williams. And my favorite Tennessee Williams is probably the, surprise, surprise, the oddest Tennessee Williams, Camino Real. Camino Real is kind of a third world Dante's Inferno with a lot of historical, literary, and cinematic characters trapped within. It takes place in some undefined developing world, third world country, and they're on the seacoast. There's something about it that's somewhat Latin American, somewhat East Asian, somewhat Middle East. The audience, we understand, is sitting in the water, in the shoreline. Behind, there are severe mountains. Let's take those as the suburban houses across our street. Front and center is a foreboding wall with a staircase going up. The staircase is going to have to suffice for that tree. On the left side of Camino Real is the Siete Mares Hotel. It's the fancy hotel. Sorry that there's only a lonely stool here. And no, this lawn furniture is usually not front and center of the house. It's usually on the porch back there, front porch. Oh, roughly where I'm sitting is a fountain. I'm not wet, though. No, sometimes I'm all wet. And then on the poor side of the street is Skid Row. Skid Row has the pawn shop and the Gypsy Stall, and the Ritz Men Only Hotel, a Fleabag Hotel. 
There are not scenes on Camino Real. There are blocks, and Tennessee Williams, a southerner, pronounced it, didn't know much about Spanish pronunciation. It's a Michael Gordon connection again. He, called, he liked to call it Camino Real, and he thought that this was kind of real life. And oh, it's far from real life, but it's so wonderful. Wonderful has been my word late in this So marvelous, so mighty God, the prince of confusion. The main character is Kilroy, uh, the all-American boy. He's hardly in this scene at all. He's been rendered the patsy, wearing a clown nose that uh, flashes red and communicates with Morse code at this point. It's pretty irrelevant to the scene. But Jacques Casanova, the old lover, Don Giovanni, is seated <laughs> at the Siete Mares Hotel with Marguerite, the aging prostitute. She's the character upon which Yaletta was based in La Traviata. We saw the drinking song uh, with the young lover, Alfredo. It's the old. They're sitting there and suddenly they hear a propeller plane, the Fugitivo. And to represent that, I used just a little chromatic passage. It's a 12 bar blues, by the way. It's also a rondo. It's a big scene in an opera. Let's get the old keyboard. Make sure it blows up. It starts a little and it gets bigger. It should expand. There it goes. Look at that. It's expanding. Isn't that great. That's roughly. This is kind of a rummy stealth plane, not a bomber. And so she says, it's time to get out of here. And Jacques does not want to leave. They do it in call and response. And it's a 12-bar blues. It's a 12-bar blues in C minor, which is pretty odd. And there are parallel perfect fifths running up. And, and it's, I've done a lot of 12-bar blues, but I've probably never written a normal one. Surprise, surprise. Like the in the mood, this though the twelve blues is only part of the component here. There is a response from Gutman, who is a lordly fat man in a white suit, and he's based really on the character of me. There's uh, local people uh, on Camino Real. Fantastic. I'm not sure that the doggies like seeing my back. <laughs> Trying not to say at any rate, but I just said it. Oh yes, Gutman, Lordy Fatman. He's really modeled on the character in Casablanca, Rick's semi-nemesis. And the actor is Sidney Greenstreet, not Peter Lorre. They worked in several movies together, and you saw Peter Lorre get knocked out by Humphrey Bogart in The Maltese Falcon. Anyway, she runs to the wall and Many passengers are disembarking. Let's see how we can do this in terms of projection. Ah, yes, but the lordly fat man in the white suit and the guard, his henchman. And by the way, the guard was in our production. This was done by Goodhart Productions, Harriet's company. She commissioned me to write on Tennessee Williams, and she was thinking of other plays, but she got this one. And we did this in a program called Fresh Voices 5. We did the entire opera over the course of two weekends. The theme of Gutman and the guard. They're very concerned. They do not want the people in Camino Real to leave, and so they basically, they do, shall we say, the current presidential snow job. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Pay no attention to that plane. I better project. How are you doing? So, descending motive of uh, fourths. And it goes all the way down 12 notes and then comes back up. And you'll hear the guard is actually the recording engineer for uh, this marvelous recording of our original cast, and that would be Carl Koryat, who actually literally wrote the book on stealth recording called Gorilla Home Studio. But it's a marvelous book, and he's a marvelous uh, recording engineer and singer. And you actually hear him. We had a cast of about 12, so we doubled a lot of roles. As a matter of fact, one of our cast members came on to Camino Real twice and died, and came on two more times and escaped from Camino and Kilroy does escape with Don Quixote at the end. Don Quixote begins the opera coming on and, and falling asleep, and arguably the, the rest of the opera is a dream. 16 blocks on the Camino Real rather than 16 scenes, and we are in block nine, so we're about halfway through. Marguerite leaves her spot. With, and I really should have those nice chairs over here. She leaves her spot at the Septimize Hotel, the 7C, she runs to the pilot who is disembarking passengers. And since we only had about six people to be passengers, what we had for them was they would get off the plane, they'd get their passport stamped, they'd look around the major, major, you know, 
round robin somewhere and come back and then do it all again. She cannot get out of Camino Real because she's got the wrong money. She's, she's a French woman. So she's got nothing but French francs. Oh, and meanwhile, Prudence and a limp, and I'm perfectly suited for that these days. You've never seen my walking stick yet in class, but <laughs> here it is now. Prudence and a limp, two portly women who have been in the opera earlier, come waddling out of the Siete Maros Hotel. And we heard this earlier with just one of them, Prudence, looking for her dog, who turns out dead. The dog's name is Treek, T R I Q U E, and she can't find Treek. And at one point sings, treat, treat, treat. Now with things in left, they try to get in line to leave Camino Real. And Marguerite is in the way and say, they say, oh, look, she's blocking. And the, the music is doing this kind of spasmodic stuff. And of course, I'm perfectly portraying this, as you can gather right now. And they claim that it's a trick, trick, trick. So we got this sort of pun that nobody's going to get unless you take it. It's the whole opera pilot, that double duty, it's a ticket taker. And that was Carl again at least in the recording. I think it was somebody else uh, when we did it live. The live cast mostly was able to do the recording, but there were a couple of months that passed, and some of our uh, people had passed out of the Bay Area. Nobody had passed away. So I think of our original cast of say 12 we had 10 to do the recording. And the video, <laughs> tragically, did not happen, or it didn't happen in any sort of kosher way. So you'll see this, this found assemblage that Images that I thought were roughly appropriate to the scenes in the place now. So good luck figuring it all out. She runs over to the pawn shop uh, and she changes her money. She tries to sell her jewels. Uh, nothing works. Meanwhile, also out of the C.F. Bar's hotel come Lord and Lady Mulligan. And once again, I'm good with the walking stick. Lord and Lady Mulligan are an old fat cat couple. And in our portrayal, it was William Loney being Lord Mulligan and my partner, Harry Martin Page, being Lady Mulligan. And as they come out, tottering and trying to get the crowd to make the way, they see the street cleaners. The street cleaners are the symbols of death on Camino Real. Initially, they just clean up the dead bodies, uh, throw them in a trash can. The trash can's on wheels. And my portrayal of the street cleaners' trash can. It was sort of like you go to the grocery store, lines in the grocery store now, some of them were pretty good. And you've ever had one of those carts that has you know, like the funky wheel? There were sometimes rolling trash cans like that too. So my portrayal of the funky wheel was one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, as a little hiccup there. And it's all in major. And I always wanted to kill somebody with nothing but major triads. Tennessee Williams talks about the piping of the street cleaners, and he probably means flute playing, fife. But I interpret it as the pipes, metal pipes, for their cleanup. And so whenever you hear the street cleaners, you hear this little clank, clank thing going on. Well, by the middle of Camino Real, they're starting to cause the dead bodies to happen. And indeed, this may be the first instance. Lord Mulligan takes a look at the street cleaners, realizes his time is up, has a heart attack, and dies. And Lady Mulligan, all she can say is pack the Lord's body in ice, ship him to Mulligan Iron. Oh, earlier... Prudence and Lent talk about, I thought they'd give you time to put your girdle in place, and this time when it cycles around, same music. It's just set up sort of like A, B, with the guards and Gutman's theme, and then back to A, and then C, the Prudence and Lent theme, and then back to the A, and of course the A is enriched by the chorus of Carl, and then D, Lord and Lady Mulligan, and then we're going to go back to A. The piece actually ends with a coda on B, but we'll get to that in just a second. So at any rate, this time around when there is a recapitulation of what would be the C music, so after D there is a C. Lord of my, very complex rondo. Not the most complex. There's another rondo in the same piece that I think has 13 themes. I had to scan it all out and I got up the letter M. But from here, I thought they'd give him time to gird his loins and get brave. All she can say is pack the Lord's body in ice, ship him to Mulligan Iron. Oh well, that's the way it goes. Well, meanwhile, the people are disembarking from Camino Real. And Marguerite has still not gone home. She's finally got the right money, but they have abandoned her. And to symbolize that abandonment, there's that kind of Steve Reichian progressive degradation rather than revelation. So there's a da -da 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 -
there be less and less of those, and then the overall pattern gets higher and higher until whoop, the plane is out of sight, gone.